Great. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting a joint meeting of the Board of Supervisors and the School Board of King William County to order. Uh, if I could have the role of the Board of Supervisors called, please. Mr. Greenwood? Yeah. Mr. Hodges? Here. Mr. Carver? Here. Mr. Warren? Here. Chairman Stoss? Here. And with that, I'd like to call for order the uh, King William County School Board. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Ms. Frazier? Here. Ms. Morrison? Here. Mr. Tuppence? Here. Ms. Stang? Here. Mr. Lee? Here. No changes from uh, either board. I'll go ahead and entertain a motion from my board to adopt the meeting agenda as presented. Second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Mr. Hawkins? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Morin? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Chairman Scott? Aye. Round thing. I'll let you go ahead and approve the agenda. But we don't, we typically do not approve. Oh, you don't approve it? Okay, well, good enough. Uh, all right, well, then let's roll it into uh, 4A uh, work session matters, FY21 school transfers versus appropriation. Uh, we've got Ms. Turnlin down to this, or do we want to just hand this over to uh, presenters? Uh, Brian is ready to present. Very good. All right, well, then let's go ahead and get him unmuted and ready to present. Okay, well, uh, good evening. Y'all ready for us to get started? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, good evening. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to you all uh, this evening, uh, you know, the findings and observations for, from our engagement. Um, you know, really, this is going to be a, an overview of our engagement, and uh, we're going to give, you know, an introduction to, to DHG and our engagement team. Uh, we'll cover <clears throat> the you know, background and, and predication of really what led to the engagement of, of DHG, uh, we'll provide a, an overview of, of the scope of work that we performed and you know, the execution of the, the procedures that we performed in connection with that scope. Uh, we'll share with you our, our observations, uh, findings, and recommendations that really touch on you know, three principal areas, uh, the first of which would include uh, the evaluation of the historical and current processes and policies around uh, the transfers of, of cash by the county uh, to the schools uh, then we'll go over our, our approach and methodology surrounding our quantitative analysis of that. And then we'll also cover uh, recommendations um, for improvements <clears throat> in, the, in the processes and policies that could be uh, considered for, for further enhancement uh, moving forward. Um, before I really get started, I, I did want to extend you know, mine as well as my team's um, collective appreciation for the opportunity uh, to assist the county and, and schools and treasurer's office, you know, with this engagement. Uh, I did want to highlight uh, the cooperation and, and collaboration by those parties really throughout our engagement, as well as, you know, in, pre in preparing our report and uh, preparation for the presentation this evening. I, I do ask that uh, we, we are open to questions um, as we go through this this evening, but uh, we, we would request to hold questions until the end. Uh, just to permit us to uh, maintain a, a good cadence as we articulate um, our findings and report to you this evening. <clears throat> uh, just quickly, an overview of, of our firm, which, which is Dixon Hughes Goodman. Uh, we're a top 20 accounting firm um, in terms of size with over 2,000 professionals across the United States and hundreds of professionals in our offices across Virginia. Um, in terms of assembling our, our engagement team to, to serve the county for, for this engagement, we, we drew upon members from our, our financial forensics practice, as well as our risk advisory practice that we thought brought a, a nice blend of, of subject matter expertise, as well as governmental industry expertise. Um, you know, we, we specialize in conducting uh, financial investigations and, and dispute consulting as well as internal audit and risk management services, which we thought was, was a nice blend of what was needed for an engagement of, of this nature. Um, my name is Brian Burns, and I'm a partner with DHG, and, and I led the engagement. <clears throat> um, I've led engagements and consulting projects for government clients uh, across Virginia, and I've testified in, in courts across Virginia on, on various disputed financial issues. Uh, tonight with me, I have... Um, Randy Sherrod, who is a manager uh, with our risk advisory practice, and he served as, as the manager on the engagement. And also Eileen Campbell, who is a consultant with our forensics practice, uh, who began her career in assurance 
and audit services and has since transitioned to uh, play an important role in our forensics practice. Um, you know, we do have a, a deep um, level of experience across Virginia in, in providing accounting and financial support services. Uh, we work with over 27 Virginia agencies, uh, providing a broad scope of services ranging from internal audit, fraud investigations, risk assessments, uh, control testings, and, and control enhancement recommendations. Uh, so we think that we have a, a nice background of, of capabilities to, to work with you all on this engagement. Um, in terms of you know, some of the background that, that led to, to our engagement, I wanted to, to set the stage with that. And um, you know, just from a big picture standpoint, uh, the cash within the school board that's contained for its funds for operating and, and cafeteria related purposes and capital funding purposes is principally held uh, with uh, Sona Bank, that financial institution. And its funding comes principally from, from two sources, you know, the first of which would be uh, county appropriations, other authorized funding and other revenues, as well as direct deposits uh, from the federal and state government. There was a, a process in place whereby uh, that the county would, would transfer cash from its bank accounts with uh, CNF Bank to the school's operating bank account with Sona Bank. So these are two different bank accounts at, at two different financial institutions. Um, in terms of how that funding was done, it was really um, predicated upon requests by the school uh, for deposits to its bank account, and then the treasurer would, would execute the, those transfers in light of you know, the treasurer's responsibility and, and management of, of the cash within those bank accounts themselves. Um, there were, it's our understanding that there were concerns that were raised in terms of uh, the volume and totality of, of cash transfers from the county to the schools and that those may have exceeded authorized levels. Uh, the county conducted a preliminary financial analysis relating to that concern. And then there were also um, observed weaknesses in the control environment that may have failed to really track and, and prevent the, the, those concerns that had been raised. And you know, the, the, the weaknesses in the control environment were really evidenced really in, in two key and fundamental places. Uh, the first of which would be in, in the financial statement audits uh, that were performed by the county's independent auditors that noted material weaknesses in, in dealing with bank reconciliations, wires and transfers uh, that directly relate to this. And then moreover, uh, the county's current independent auditor who is uh, Robinson, Farmer and Cox uh, performed an agreed upon procedure engagement in the fall of, of 2020 and had similar uh, observations with respect to, you know, general weaknesses in the control environment with respect to, you know, wire transfers, bank reconciliations, documentation, segregation of duties, approvals and documentations and things of that nature. So um, those observations existed in terms of, of, of a lack of, of control that could prevent something like this from occurring, you know, assuming that it, that it did. And uh, that was really the overall predication that, that led to you know, DHG's engagement to assist with this. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll touch on now is, is our scope of work and, and the procedures that we performed. Um, you know, when we're engaged to provide financial consulting services and, and matters of this nature, we take a five-step approach. Um, and that five-step approach really entails scoping the engagement and planning it with our clients. Uh, we'll collect the necessary information. Uh, we'll conduct interviews and perform financial analysis and fact-finding throughout that process. Uh, we'll synthesize our analysis and ultimately uh, report and communicate our findings as part of the fourth step. And then finally, we do make recommendations uh, for remediation um, and improvements uh, moving forward. So our first step really entailed uh, conducting interviews and, and making inquiries of uh, relevant personnel within the county, uh, the treasurer's office, as well as the schools. Uh, we talked to the number of different folks, you know, both currently employed as, as well as other ones that have, have retired and, and transitioned away from, from those roles. Um, it was a collaborative process. You know, we did gain input from, from all parties. Uh, we conducted both a remote collection of documents as well as an on-site uh, inspection and collection of documents, just given the, the hard copy nature of some of the documents we really needed to uh, to get on site, but you know, really the county and schools did a great job of, of tracking down everything that they could 
and um, and sharing those those with us remotely to you know get, given the current environment in which we were we were operating. Um, we we did gain an understanding of uh, the control environment processes, policies, and procedures that re- that relate to uh, the transfers of, of cash from the county to the schools. Um, then after we gained that understanding, we worked with uh, the folks at the county to, to evaluate and develop a quantitative analysis and methodology to address the identified concerns. And, and we'll go through that methodology here shortly. And I, I wanna make sure that we characterize the, the, the approach and scope of work that we did in a manner that is really clear and that we did not conduct an audit of any nature. Uh, this is not a forensic audit. This is not a financial statement audit. And that term is, is used loosely um, within a variety of different contexts. And I wanna be clear that really an audit is, is designed to express an opinion on financial statements, whereby an auditor does testing and procedures to obtain reasonable assurance as to whether financial statements are free of material misstatement. Um, in accordance with GAAP, you know, there's these concepts of materiality and, and gaining reasonable assurance and conducting tests and things of that nature. And it's really to make sure the financial statements are presented in accordance with GAAP. And, and really, you know, that's not what we were doing here. This is a, a, a financial consulting engagement uh, to analyze and, and trace funds and accounts at the transactional level. Uh, to address the the specific concerns that have been raised. Um, So this is looking at general ledgers, banking records, substantiating documents and resolutions. So it's more of a a rifle shot based approach to to look at uh, the the potential matters at hand. And it it also was structured in a way that it was to get to a reasonable answer, uh, but in the most cost effective approach possible. You know, we did not trace every single expenditure uh, by the schools that, that were incurred over this time period, you know, that would be an incredibly high cost to be able to do that and was really cost prohibitive. And so the methodology that was employed in this instance, I think, struck the right balance of, of reasonable assurance uh, associated with what the objectives in this engagement were. So what I'll do now is to highlight uh, the quantitative analysis that we performed. Uh, we performed this over the time period of, of 2015 to 2020. Uh, at the request of the county. And really we were analyzing the volume of of, of cash transfers from the county to the schools from bank account to bank account and comparing those to authorized levels of transfers uh, that will be indicated through appropriations and resolutions and otherwise other authorized means. Um, the first starting point for that may be just to say, well, let's look at the documentation surrounding each of the cash transfers individually. You know, unfortunately, there is not at the time a lot of documentation and substantiation for each of the cash transfers. So our methodology was to look at them on more of a, a cumulative approach over the course of time, comparing that those on a cumulative basis year over year of uh, the actual transfers to the authorized transfers, just, just given the nature of the, of the documentation, that was the approach that, that was required. Uh, it was a pretty time intensive and, and cumbersome analysis, just given the way that you know, journal entries and deposits and, and disbursements are documented and tracked within the accounting system, as well as the, the banking transactions themselves. Uh, There's a lot of of peeling of the onion, I guess, if you will say, having to dig into batch entries and isolating really what pertained to these specific issues that we were investigating and analyzing. So our steps from from an approach standpoint were were first to determine the authorized school appropriations and and then reconcile those to the the county's accounting system. And we were able to do that uh, without exception. Uh, there, There were no differences between what we determined to be appropriated as opposed to what was reflected in the, com- in the county's accounting system. Um, to determine, there is a distinction between budgeted appropriations and authorized appropriations in that the budgeted versus actual can differ in light of actual non-split levy tax revenue. So that was something that we did take into account as part of uh, the first step, which would be to determine the authorized school appropriation. The next step was analyzing the magnitude of authorized transfers, uh, because in addition to appropriations that would relate to the transfers of cash from the county to the schools, 
There's also other types of, of authorized transfers that would apply. Um, and we did tracing, analyze, substantiating documents, and, and perform testing to verify those amounts. And these would relate to areas such as uh, school revenue transmittals, uh, sales tax, uh, resolutions relating to proffers, split levy funds, and restricted general funds. And then finally, uh, self-insurance fund reimbursements. And so that was really the totality of, of the transactions and amounts that would constitute what we're characterizing as authorized transfers. Then the next step was to quantify the, the actual cash transfers from the county's bank accounts to the, school, the school's bank accounts. And we converted the actual banking activity reflected in the bank statements into Excel and, and created a database from which we could perform our analysis. Uh, we identified 94 transfers uh, from the county's bank to the school's bank, uh, totaling about $76 million over the, over the period analyzed, again, 2015 to 2020. Um, we were able to trace those to the accounting system without exception. Um, you know, it was a highly burdensome process, but, but necessary given the objectives of the engagement and um, were able to perform that again without exception, analyzing the accounting system, breaking apart some of those batch journal entries, as well as analyzing hard copy treasurer cash reports and tapes that were utilized to, to make some of these entries into the system and document how much was actually transferred um, from the banks and then tying that into the accounting system. Um, so that is how we identified the actual cash transfers and compared them to what was in the system. And then finally, having those two critical data points that we talked about over the analysis period, we compared those actual transfers uh, to the authorized transfers is the final results of, of our engagement. So now to kind of wrap up, we'll go through um, our overall observations and findings and the results of the, the quantitative aspects to it. Um, so we, we gained an, an understanding, like I said, of the documentation policies and procedures around really three key areas. Um, you know, the, what was the authorized funding naturally is documented by appropriations and resolutions. You know, what were the amounts transferred to the school board to date in any given fiscal year? And then what would be the reigning amount available to be transferred to the school board? And you know what we observed, which is I think consistent with you know what was reflected in in, in the prior uh, annual reports and, and and the findings of the current auditor, is that there are some some lack of established policies, processes, and procedures um, around this process. Um, there was really infrequent communication between the treasurers, the school, and the county with respect to to, the, to this activity. And there, there was a lack of, of overall documentation uh, that was retained to substantiate the amount of each cash transfer that was made. And I think ultimately our, our assessment was that that environment really constituted overall, an overall weakness that would mitigate the risk of, of, of the cash transfers potentially exceeding authorized transfer. And again, that observation is, is consistent with uh, the prior and, and current auditors. Now, we did observe um, some notable improvements that we did want to highlight uh, in terms of, of improvements that have been implemented um, here you know, recently, uh, at least over the past six months or, or likely longer. Um, first of all, in terms of documentation and procedures, you know, the, the county had implemented a tracking of funds you know, relative to authorized appropriations. So again, tracking the appropriations with resolutions, Let's look out at how much has been transferred to the schools to date, how much remaining is available. So they're doing that independent calculation and assessment. At the same time, the school board is independently doing the similar type of, of calculation where they're tracking the appropriations and spending. And then on at least a monthly basis, um, and maybe more frequent, there is a, a comparison that is being undertaken you know, by the school, the treasurer, and, and the county you know, to kind of compare notes and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, so that are that is some notable improvements that, that we have seen you know, implemented in based on, a, on our interviews um, of relevant personnel. You know, finally, one important um, other observation to highlight is that you know, throughout the, the course of our engagement and, and completion of this report and presentation with you all here tonight, uh, really, there were no indications of, of fraud or malfeasance uh, by, by any of, of the current personnel within the organization or prior personnel. 
Um, you know, I, I can't sit here and tell you that there, I can't provide you with absolute assurance that there was none of that, but uh, nothing came to our attention uh, throughout the course of the engagement, if there would be any indication of anything inappropriate uh, that, that was undertaken here. Um, in terms of the results of the quantitative aspect to this, um, you know, we identified actual transfers uh, totaling $76,016,518. million uh, When we compared that to the authorized transfers, it compared very similarly in that it was $76,048,158, uh, such that the net difference between the two would be that actual transfers were under the authorized transfers by approximately $31,000. Uh, to be more specific, $31,000, $31,640. Now, you know, there, there were years in which um, actual transfers exceed authorized transfers and vice versa. Uh, but at the end of the day, the net actual result over this time period were, were that they were um, netted out to a, a very nominal or, or immaterial amount, as I highlighted above or highlighted in our report and just articulated to you all. Um, and finally, just to round out some, some overall you know, recommendations uh, for improvements to the processes and procedures. And, and again, we've already seen uh, some of these uh, implemented, which, which is a positive naturally, is uh, to improve the, the internal uh, communications within each department. Uh, so within the county, within the treasurers, you know, within, within the school, and then also the external communication between those stakeholders on you know, expectations, responsibilities, documentation. You know, let's, let's do this on a more timely and, and relevant basis, be able to track these types of, of issues um, where they are conducted in, in rarely scheduled intervals. Um, but that really wouldn't preclude, you know, any type of, of informal communication, but just trying to have, you know, these regularly scheduled touch points just to stay on track um, is a recommendation. Uh, the next would be to, to really standardize and memorialize uh, procedures and documentation requirements around this. Um, memorialize them, document them, review them and update them periodically and make sure that they're communicated to personnel and house in a place that they can read and consider from time to time if they ever have any questions. Um, I would say enhanced documentation. You know, there should be work papers with bank reconciliations, you know, reconciliations to appropriations, and then support for you know, authorized uh, you know, cash transfer levels is authorized you know, through the budgeting process and, and further resolutions. Um, <clears throat> we recommend and, and naturally, I'm, I'm going to touch on segregation of duties and, and you know, cost benefit considerations are always something that comes in when you're thinking about that. You know, we work with nonprofits and smaller organizations, and we understand that you can't employ the world to be able to do some of these things. So, again, I, we, we understand those challenges and, 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 and what you face from a fiscal standpoint and cost benefit standpoint with respect to segregation of duties. But we, we do recommend. Um, you know, as much as we can, you know, separations of responsibilities as it relates to, you know, reconciling of bank accounts and, you know, who is authorizing and documenting transactions within the accounting system. That's just the key areas that we would highlight. Um, there was a lot of hard copy uh, approach to, to what was done historically um, in terms of, you know, handwritten notes on, on bank statements and, and ledgers and whatnot that were kept on site. You know, again, we would we support the use of hard copy documents to substantiate and, and, and authorize transactions, but doing more of, of this type of work electronically, we, we think would, would be helpful because it, it could be electronically stored in a secure location and, and be accessible from, from multiple parties in, in a secure manner, subject to, to various types of, of approvals and segregations of duties. Uh, finally, in terms of um, you know, banking operations, we, we recommend um, a consolidation of, of banking operations. I, I know that um, banking had been done at, at two different financial institutions, um, including CNF as, as well as SONA. You know, I think that um, what we observe in practice oftentimes is, as well as uh, you know, what we've seen in terms of best practices would be to have really the, the funds contained within one financial institution. You know, we think it helps with simplicity. Um, it can enhance you know, operational effectiveness, lessen the, the record keeping requirements, and, and also uh, maximize the interest income. If you got all the money in one spot, 
there is the opportunity to uh, generate uh, additional income you know, within the county nationally, which, which would be a, a positive. Um, and then finally, you know, if the decision is made to continue with the separate financial institution based approach, we, we, would, we would recommend to minimize um, the needs to transfer funds from the county to the school board. So if there's an opportunity to deposit outside funds, perhaps putting those directly in the school's bank account and accounting for it from there, as opposed to putting it in the county's account and then transferring it over to uh, the school's account, it just requires a lot of excess, extra steps and documentation and complexity, just trying to take steps to, to try and simplify and, and minimize um, you know, the complexity of those types of, of issues. <clears throat> and so with that, uh, that rounds out my, my presentation and I will, um, open the floor to, to my colleagues, uh, Randy or Eileen, if they want to highlight anything. And then also, uh, you know, happy to, um, to respond to any questions uh, that you all may have. I'll let your people go first if they have anything they want to add before we start chiming in. Okay. No, I, uh, Brian, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, again, as Brian said earlier, we appreciate the opportunity to serve uh, King William County, um, County administration and, and the schools. So we appreciate the uh, opportunity to do this work. Thank you. Can I echo what Brian and Randy have said and don't have anything further to add? Uh, okay, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll uh, give my members an opportunity first, okay. Uh, anybody from uh, the, the board, I'll go ahead and go down the line. Mr. Morin. Uh, no, my, my biggest concern and what I've <coughs> heard is that things are, things are in place now. Things are in place now, processes, procedures to uh, as we go forward to prevent this from uh, occurring again, discrepancies. And, that's my major concern this whole report. Yeah, I'll just reiterate again, we are all a family. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this report. Um, anyway, that's better. Pleased with the report too, but uh, like some of the recommendations are made are, are like I said, directed to us. But uh, I just wanted to point out to the staff and public that we have no control of what the treasurer's office does. We can't force them to use one bank account, two bank accounts, or ten bank accounts. That's up to them because they are constitutional officers just like we are. So they do what they see fit. And I think we were told in the past that they did that for financial reasons because they got better interest rates at certain things. But like I said, that your recommendations I'm sure will be taken by them as well as us. So thanks for pointing out everything. I just hope like I said it's uh, I guess in the past we didn't have and uh, Mr. Skowski knows I remember previous was it also Ms. Stone she was on the previous board but too we didn't have a lot of transparency back in the day. And I think we've come a long ways uh, since then those times and uh, I guess it's a uh, Unfortunate that we had to have something like this to bring us all back together, but I think we were headed that way. And this gives us some pointers on what we need to do to move forward and keep everything on track. So thank you very much. Mr. Hodges. Uh, just trying to understand everything that we have been given and everything. Is it my understanding that there, there was overpayment and then we rounded it out in a five-year term? Is that somewhat of what happened? I think Mr. Hodges' question is there were instances in certain years of appropriations or, or cash transfers exceeding appropriations. Yes, that's what we found during our review. That's, that's, what I, that's really all I have. I apologize. I muted myself and then... <laughs> couldn't unmute, but I think somebody unmuted me. So Randy took care of that. Yes, that's, that's correct. 
Um, I guess a couple of my specific questions are those years in which those appropriations or cash transfers exceeded appropriations. Um, and I don't know that this would have been possible, but it, did we identify the source of those funds? Was it perhaps from uh, revenues coming in higher on split levy funds or, or are we just not really able to determine that? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that was um, beyond the scope of what we were asked to, to do in terms of our presentation. But, um, you know, I, I think that there is information contained within what we presented that, that will permit, you know, further investigation by, by the treasurer or schools or county if, if that was something that they would desire to do. I, I, I see that. We'll get her on. Yeah. Um, if you want to go ahead, uh, Mr. Wolf, and, and get her unmuted, I'll, I'll give her an opportunity here. Um, it, yeah, I, I'm overall I'm pleased with the with the result. Um, what what I'm interested in is how we move forward, especially in relation to the, to the treasurer. And I'm going to get her in on this call here in a second and talk about her. Let her talk about her feelings on this report and, and uh, you know some things that her office and department can do to help us move in the right direction with uh, you know, accurately uh, tracking these things and, and uh, making sure that there are not misunderstandings as we had here going forward. So uh, Ms. Bancroft, if, if you're on an unmuted, um, feel free. I am, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, uh, I was very pleased actually with the report. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised at um, what they found. Um, I think f uh, generally overall, um, you know, things could be improved and I've made steps to do that. Um, I think you all will be pleased that I have made the decision to discontinue banking with CNF. I have opened all new accounts with Sona, now premise. Um, so it's, um, it's a slow process. Um, I got my scan machine last week. We will be scanning checks now directly into the bank accounts with um, Premise. I did negotiate for um, 60 basis points, whereas CNF was paying us 50 basis points and they had indicated that that was um, a little bit above and beyond what they normally do. Um, and I appreciate that. However, I did negotiate 60 basis points with uh, Premise. Um, everything I'm getting with Premise is free. Um, so I'm glad to report that as well. Um, I've been talking with Natasha when um, Edmonds, when we go live with Edmonds, I will be depositing items directly to um, the, the school's accounts. I will not be processing any more deposits into, you know, one bank and then transfer it to another bank. When we enter that transaction into Edmonds, the my deputies will enter it directly into the Sona schools accounts or cafeteria, what have you. So it's going to be a, a, a much better um, audit trail. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, report that. Um, so we'll see going mm -hmm. down the road. You know, I, I do like the idea of having the one bank. It will be a lot easier for reconciliation purposes. It will be a, a easier for audit purposes. I do think it will be easier to keep the, the school accounts, the cafeteria and the school funds separate, but within the same bank. So I think that's gonna be a, a much cleaner, easier process to manage and as far as an audit trail. Um, so that's where I'm leaning right now. Um, so I am pleased to say I, I, have, I am making those changes. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Mr. Hodges? I, I don't really have anything else. I, I'm sure that at some point we're going to have to show the town what went on during these years and that the money was properly taken from the correct revenue. Right. And, and that was kind of the point of my question in the years in which there was the excessive cash transfer. Um, I'm sure that the town is going to have some questions about the source of those funds and, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to need to come up with an answer, good, bad, or indifferent as to, as to what it was. And then, um, you know, reconcile anything with them that we need to reconcile. 
Um, so that, that's a task that's, that's, that's uh, the next big lift for our people to figure that out and then uh, report to town uh, what we find. Uh, Mr. Tuffets, uh, your membership. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miskowski. I'll start uh, over here with uh, Ms. Morrison. Do you have any questions? Ms. Um, well, I'd just like to uh, thank DHG for their, their work and the time that they spend on this. And I know it's very difficult to uh, recreate five years of transactions to uh, review, especially with the turnover and personnel. Um, I think there's some great recommendations in regards to efficiency and record keeping and documentation. So I certainly appreciate that and the county staff and school staff working together to, uh, to bring, that, um, bring that forward. I think it is important to recognize that any excess cash balances are in the custody of the treasurer at all times. Um, and that we know that over the period of five years where there may have been timing differences, but we know when we look at the period in its entirety that um, they, they settled up. But certainly if there is concern by the town and I, and I can understand that, that maybe this is the perfect opportunity to just really go back and look at the entire split tax levy and you know pull that all together and get comfort with all of that. So that, that makes sense to me. But um, again, just like to thank you for the recommendations and they, they make sense to me and I think they will be beneficial to, uh, to all parties. Thank you, Ms. Trencher. Mr. And and with that, Chairman Miskowski, I'd also like to thank um, DHG and uh, Mr. Burns and Mr. Shrug and, and Ms. Campbell on their hard work. I did uh, have the opportunity to participate in several of the phone calls uh, jointly with the county and also uh, individually with the school system. Um, I can say the process was very thorough. It was a uh, learning exercise, I think, for everyone involved um, and that the school system is uh, committed to implementing any of the recommendations or all the recommendations that uh, DHG has put forward on our side. And then also I'd like to offer out to the Board of Supervisors um, that previously we used to have a finance committee that was jointly between the county and the school system that dated back um, probably to 2007 that kind of has dissipated uh, through the years um, where there were two school board members, two board of supervisors, county administrator, finance director on the county side, superintendent, the finance director, and we may now want to uh, potentially uh, have the treasurer as a part of that committee. So we, we would like to make the recommendation to, to further to go ahead and reinstitute um, that committee to begin to work through all these processes, get everything documented, and really bring back that working relationship that we had between our administrations uh, previously. Uh, put it on your agenda, we'll put it on ours. We'll get it in the panel and we uh, and, and, uh, Okay. Good. Just wanted to point out we did already start that new board and we found out legally that it was not proper. Well, the only persons that we can have on that board were the treasurer, chairman of the board of supervisors, and one person from the county. But like I said, when I came and I had those meetings with the previous treasurer, we were able to have subcommittees, which I talked to Mr. Tuffets also. We can have subcommittees that have all those people, two people from school board, two people from every department. And I was going to push that, but then it never got any further. And then since we were told we only had three people, we never met again. So the committee video, and that's the word, the committee, Steve, you may remember it, it the wording too, it's a committee or I think it yeah, was committee something we couldn't about. call it, but Finance board, I think, or finance committee. Anyway, we, we it's a finance board with right. three people right. right now. You can make a committee. Right. right. So yeah, there's, there's a distinction in right. the code that we're, we're aware of. Right. Um, so that's all so it's already started. There's also powers that that, that that board would have that I don't know that this committee is seeking. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that board has the power to direct the investment policy of the treasurer and things of that nature. And I don't think that's what we're after. Yeah, okay. We're after communication and transparency. And, uh, 
uh, you know, a liaison between staff, the board, the treasurer, and making sure that we're all on the same page on a, on a rolling basis as mm -hmm. opposed to um, every five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> <great thing. laughs> I apologize if I may add something. Um, where I've seen that work really well also is um, where your auditors would have, would meet with this committee prior to the audit. Um, it's an opportunity. Sometimes there's even a clay, closed session for the elected officials that if they have some concerns or specific areas they want the auditors to look at, they can share that with them. And then at the end of the report, but before it's public and released, the audit committee will come back and meet with this group again. And so there's an opportunity to um, receive that information and provide feedback. And that's often quite um, successful in my experience. You just had a microphone, so I'm happy to give you mine. Well, look, as far as the discussions between the, the, the two chairs have gone as we work through this process, um, I think we would agree that the, what, what we wanted to see through this, regardless of the actuarial outcome, regardless of the numbers, was a path forward. Um, I'm pleased that the numbers show that we are effectively balanced. You know, um, that, that there's not some big delta that we need to make up, that there's not some uh, money that's in the wrong place from some time ago. Um, you know, we can put we can put that issue now to bed for the most part, except for what we're going to have to clear with the town, and we can start to to move forward. I'll say from, from my uh, personal experience serving on the Board of Supervisors, I've always enjoyed a wonderful relationship with my counterpart, uh, Ms. Morrison, and the number of, of school board members. My service Ms. Stone, Mr. Thomas and I talk regularly, Ms. Frazier and I had a long history. Mr. Lee, get to know you, but what? So that's good. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I want to take, uh, you know, those types of relationships that, that we, we all share with our board counterparts, and I want that to, to uh, carry out through relationships with staff from this building to the school board offices. Um, you know, I, I want professionalism, I want communication, I want openness. Um, and uh, and that's what I think these boards can commit to. And that's what we're gonna commit our staff to making it. And Mr. Chairman, I completely concur on the, the school board's behalf. Um, we want to have a working relationship, a professional working relationship with the county administration as well, our administration to administration um, that is transparent, that can openly talk, discuss issues, move forward, um, and, and resolve anything that needs to be resolved. Um, and we want it to be fully transparent on our side as well. Um, and we, we welcome it with open arms. And we'll have those same expectations of our staff. Now, before I go get my guitar, it's been a lot. Uh, well, do you guys want to stick around for the Edmund software update, or do you want to adjourn and allow people to uh, run for the hills? Or uh, did you plan on sticking around for the whole thing? I, I'll give you the opportunity to leave. If you want. I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the school board without objection, and I do plan on staying for the rest of the day. I know. Okay. No such luck for us, gentlemen. So, so do we go up to the to the mics now? Or we can stay here? Now we're all set up right here. Okay. Not you're saying. All right, uh, Edmonds software update, Mr. Wolf. Sorry. Uh, right. Well, they're they're not uh, convened in a formal meeting, so they're going to get up as as uh, whenever they please. And, and on behalf of the Board of Supervisors and our staff, I, I thank you guys for your work as well. And this was a difficult, long process with a lot of uh, a lot of information to sit through. So we really appreciate the work that you did. Uh, and we look forward to implementing these, these uh, recommendations to move uh, our collective governing bodies forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. All right, good evening, board. Um, so from last time I was here uh, speaking uh, on Edmonds three or four weeks ago, we have, um, I have an update for you. So the implementation that was scheduled to 
have gone on live on May 3rd uh, will now be pushed back at least two more weeks, maybe a third. Uh, there was a meeting with Edmonds and the Treasurer's Office, as well as Commissioner Revenue's Office on April 28th, um, where lots of questions of procedural uh, day to day procedures were asked, and it's just taking a while to get through everything with both offices. Some of the questions were not able to be answered uh, during that meeting. Um, I received a phone call from Brian Adams, who is the uh, project manager from Edmonds uh, after that, and he has requested two more meetings. Uh, he originally had asked for one meeting with Commissioner Revenue's office, one meeting with the Treasurer's office. I did receive an email from him today stating that we could uh, do all of this in one meeting if we could get through it within two hours. So we're going to see how that goes. He has requested for tomorrow or Friday. Um, Commissioner Revenue's office is on board for that. Just waiting to hear back from um, the treasurer on it on her availability. Um, as I stated, the extra time was needed because there were several uh, procedural questions as they uh, went through uh, that were just unable to be answered at that time. Uh, and they have since emailed the questions uh, to get answers, hopefully prior to the meeting, to be able to um, basically build the database for them to be able to use, um, just like we did with finance. Uh, we are hoping to still uh, be on track for May 25th to be able to build uh, everything out of Edmonds. Uh, tomorrow's after, tomorrow afternoon's meeting will give us uh, a time frame on that. Uh, the lockbox that has been uh, previously in place will not be in place this year, uh, so no one will have to mail their payments to Maryland. Uh, they will be mailing them here to the county. Uh, we will be taking care of those all in-house. Um, that was the treasurer's decision with, as she just mentioned, changing banks. There's just not enough time to get everything in order uh, to be able to do that. But she is um, confident that her staff will be able to handle uh, taking care of the building in-house. Her words, sir. Uh, DSS says uh, that Vita, uh, VITA, not Ms. Frazier. Um, we were able to finally get in touch with their IT staff, uh, and they have started putting the programs and everything in place uh, for DSS to access the database. I was over there today. Of course, there was an issue, and since I don't have uh, admin uh, rights to be able to work on their computers, we had to reach back out to the ITA VITA, uh, waiting to hear back on when they can um, get that fixed. I did meet with uh, Dr. White, uh, Ms. Longus, and uh, Mr. Brookie last week. I had a very good discussion on um, some of their challenges uh, with Edmonds. Uh, I have all of those in writing, almost all of those. If there's anything else that comes up, they will send them over. Uh, I do have a meeting with Brian Adams. Once again, he's the project manager from Edmonds tomorrow uh, to discuss these. Some of these are uh, items that are not in place with Edmonds. Uh, they are still a newer company. They are growing as they get more clients and are able to put in um, put in place more uh, what's more options for us to be able to do what we would like to do. Uh, mainly writing reports. We're having some challenges with some reports. Uh, bringing them to bring them over into or non-Excel non forms, uh, things like that. So we're working through that. Uh, one thing that I did want to, to stress is that currently the staff, uh, both finance, the county, and the schools are still doing double entry in Bright and in Edmonds um, until the tax phase goes live. Um, so since November for county and Jan 1st of January for uh, the schools, they have all been doing double entry. So it is very um, important and it would be very nice to get this in place as soon as possible and we are working through that. Any questions? Okay. So the... So I think I picked up the tax bills are still going to be mailed out on time if we don't have any more delays? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So, because they all do on the 25th. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, two weeks from today. This morning. Okay. Anybody?
Anybody else? Okay. Um, so I see that Ms. Bancroft is, is muted. Maybe we can get her. Because I, um, I know maybe there's not time enough to, 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 to change course, but um, you know, processing checks is an arduous activity. We're, we're confident we can get that handled with, with what you have. Yes, um, I inquired with my deputies prior to that, and they said there should not be any problem. My part-time uh, deputy started today, um, so and I'm also going to be able to pitch in and assist in that process too. So I think between the four of us, we shouldn't have a problem. Um, I did create. Uh, I got the books last week from the Commissioner of Revenue's office, um, so I have. Uh, created the bills and the bill file and I sent the bill file to BMS so they do have the file they are prepared to print um, they have I just once they give me the okay then I'm ready to uh, populate them into the software that you know if it happens to be that we send them out in bright we'll be processing them the payments in to Edmonds so um, by law, we have until we have 15 days prior to the due date to make sure that citizens um, receive their bills. Um, so that is 15 days before June 25th that they are to have them by law, and we will definitely have them uh, to them before that. Okay. okay. Um, we obviously it, it's it's pretty important we see this through as, as quickly as we can because we don't want to end up uh, double entering or having to pay for software subscriptions that we don't want or need if we can avoid it. Um, so yeah, uh, from, from the board's uh, perspective, we just, we want to see this through. So, you know, anything we can do to help get it done, uh, our, our people are there. So, okay. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right, next up, C, upcoming public hearings. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that, Ms. Bancroft, since I have you? No, I don't think so. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Uh, item C, upcoming public hearings. Ms. Graham. Good evening. Good evening. Can you press that button on that? I wanted to give y'all some uh, advanced information on the upcoming public hearings that we're going to be having. Um, there will be five. This will be at the uh, May 24th meeting. Um, all of these have gone before the planning commission. All have been approved, uh, some with conditions, most of them with conditions. Um, but also to give you a chance to Get out and take a look at some of the sites. Um, the King William Sand and Gravel, uh, a few of our planning commission members did go out there and visit the site. Um, they are open for any of the board members to also go out and take a look. Um, same thing with um, the, the land uh, landing uh, that uh, Coastal Farm Services has. They have a gate there that's locked, but if he knows that somebody wants to come out and take a look, uh, just give him a call and he'll have the gate unlocked so you can go out and take a look at that also. Um, the three of them, of course, are accessory dwellings. Uh, one is going to be, one is attached um, that will be off the rear of the property. One is the King William Brown. That's just a modification to a conditional use permit that already exists. Um, and their plan is to take the proposed site, when they finish with site one, they'll close that up and they'll open up this one. Um, and doing that, there will not be an increase in traffic or um, use of uh, materials and equipment or anything. It, it will run the same as it's always run. Um, and we haven't had any complaints on them since I've been here. Uh, the other one, Coastal uh, Farm Service, we have had um, 
I think people speak out and that will be in your packets when they come out with some additional information. Yep. Okay. He told me to move closer. Oh, Sherry, I know that I asked you uh, probably about a week ago if it was anything that you could do with GIS to show how close those three proposed, well, this proposed air uh, airstrip is to the other two. Uh, I have not played with it yet. Yeah. Um, I may see if that's something that Betty can help me with. Yeah, I'm thinking if we could look at that, um, it might clear up some of my concerns. She's our GIS expert, so okay. I, I may have to depend on her for a little help on that. Okay. Yeah. You guys end now. <laughs> that's why I just wanted to spread it off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. Graham, uh, Mr. Kraut was uh, very active today from about 7 30 until leaving to come here from his current airstrip. Uh, without getting into much detail, will he be uh, intending to abandon that airstrip to go to the new airstrip? Do we have any idea that we use both of them? Or? No, um, it's another corporation, and I've got all that written down. Um, but he is uh, one of the officers of the corporation. But that landing strip that he had a commission use permit operated on about a year ago um, will remain an active airstrip. Every time six, it takes six off, times I know. <laughs> over my house today, six times the old. Yeah. Well, all that information will be in the packet. Thank you. Mr. Greenwood, Mr. Hines. I, I don't have anything. I, I'm having a little difficult time hearing on the other end. What airstrip are we talking about? This is an a airstrip. It's about 3,500 uh, feet off of Landing Road. Uh, it's supposed to be a grass airstrip. Not okay. Okay. Thing. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Step County Property on Landing Road requests to sell or grant right of way. Mr. Hudson. I'm working off an old agenda, so it's we'll circle back to it that's fine good evening um about a month ago i was uh contacted um by the owners of property next to um tax map parcel 26-45a which is county property. Um, the owners of tax map 26-44, uh, Judy Swamp, are looking to sell their property <clears throat> and uh, wanted deeded right-of-way access through our property onto Landing Road. Um, that is the access that has always been used for that property, but looking through the records, we do not see any deeded access um, to that property. Um, when we conveyed this to them. They said that they would be amenable to either working towards that right of way agreement with the county or actually purchasing the county's property and thus giving themselves uh, right of way uh, access. Um, this property has been county owned since 1966. The county hasn't been able to take much advantage of it. It's, uh, it's blood prone and um, Sheriff's had a hard time maintaining it. It's prone to vandalism. On the other hand, it is one of the very few river accesses that King William has. Um, I was out there last summer with the previous county administrator meeting with a representative from the Department of Land Conservation and uh, Conservation and Recreation, as well as the uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, seeing what options um, they might be able to help us with. Um, and they were interested in working through some grants that could potentially, um, it would still remain county owned, but they could use grant money to um, improve the site. Um, I had not heard anything from them uh, since that time, um, but I have reached out to them since 
um, hearing from these property owners as well as since writing this email. Um, they have not forgotten it. They have actually gone back out there several times over the last few months. Um, it is, they confirmed, it is very flood prone and for much of the year it's either swampy or underwater, um, which limits its uh, access. Last year was pretty wet. Um, on the other hand, they still, they recommend uh, keeping it. They wish the county would keep it so um, they could use grants to buy a land, uh, buy a conservation easement on the property and use that money to fund uh, some improvements, even if it's just dumping a lot of gravel there and improving uh, the access and turnaround area. So what I'm asking the, from the board is, is there any consistent feelings about this property, history that I don't know about, any guidance that you would like to give the county? Yes, Steve, but you probably remember up with this property up, I think a couple of times. Uh, it is people that have approached me, the kayak, canoe, uh, two people that actually fished there over the years. And Ed, I think you're probably familiar, somewhat familiar with it too. At one time, that property landing road was partially state maintained. I don't know whether they abandoned it, but do you know how far? state maintenance goes if at I all. know it's partly state maintains yeah. but a large part of it is not and so far as the it seems like it's insinuated that the county has spent money there for the upkeep I've never seen it uh, as far as I know the county hasn't spent money and therefore the upkeep has fallen by the wayside the only money right. that was put into it that I know of was trying to put a barricade uh, across it and um, citizens just drove around it yeah, I'm not in favor of selling it. The, the assessed value is $32,600. It was gifted to the county probably for the recreation of its citizens. Uh, and they are, even if we afford them a right of way, that has value uh, because it's going to increase the value of their property Certainly. greatly. Certainly. And uh, well, Mr. Wagner sent out an email earlier today and it was was a very good email and it made a lot of sense you know use that as a bargaining tool maybe to uh, get them to make some improvements uh, and make it more accessible to the people in King William that's just that they're just my thoughts and very same mm -hmm. uh, opinion that that's the only I believe the only publicly accessible access to that part of the Pamunkey uh, I have enjoyed swimming in that uh, very location many times. I'm not a kayaker, but uh, it's a perfect place for that activity. Uh, I would like to see the county uh, continue to try to work with the uh, uh, Department of Game. What are they called now? It's not uh, DW or whatever, whatever they are now. To continue working with them to see if we can develop this into something. Maybe throw it to the EDA. Uh, give them a project to, uh, to focus into but uh, uh, I'm an advocate of keeping it. I, I think I asked the question the last time we discussed it, and, and I don't know if we approached them or not, but what about the Public Access Authority, the Chet Middle Peninsula Chesapeake Bay Public Access Authority? I am not aware of that. Okay. Uh, it's it's uh, managed by Louis Lawrence, um, uh, but they, uh, they have quite an inventory of publicly accessible land for purposes basically for accessing the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay um, and have access to uh, pots of money and funding sources that uh, we certainly probably don't um, and, and that may even not be necessarily accessible to DGIF or DCR. Um, so uh, I would I would agree that I, I would rather us hold on to it and for now uh, negotiate a right of way uh, agreement with with the landowner, but I'd like to see us approach the PAA and see if they have use for it, and maybe they could put it to better use than we can if we turn it over to to them. Um, or you know, maybe it's better for us to hold on to it and, and utilize the resources through DCR or DGIF. Right. But uh, I would agree that I would like to see it um, maintained, if not further developed, as some type of access um, in that area. That makes sense, and. Uh... I know one of the, the issues with uh, uh, DGIF and conservation, um, well, issues, what they're looking for 
is a partner or a second uh, access point. So there's a put in a takeout point and uh, perhaps they might be able to help um, find one of those as well. Right, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to do the reach out to Louie. Um, I can contact him. That, that's fine, I was gonna say, I've got some background in the PAA, but not, not a ton, but they, they manage a ton of properties like that. Uh, I don't know what the status is with uh, King, King William Sand and Gravel, but uh, somewhere in that area would be the perfect pickup for kayaks, canoes. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the uh, towns and zone their property. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether any access could be afforded there, but that would be perfect, you know, because, you, you know, just like they said, you have to have a pickup point. That would be a, a, a good float or, or a good uh, kayak trip from, okay. from that point there. Mr. Hodges, you do as much water recreation as any of us. You got any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's correct. That's one of the two, only two locations you can put in or take out on the Pamunkey in King William County. Uh, and, and it's, I don't put in over there because there are a whole lot more places on the map than I say. And if they did have more over there, we'd probably utilize it. I think the other one is uh, right around, if I'm not incorrect, the Pamunkey Indian Reservation. Isn't there, isn't there one other site there? That's, that's the one I'm aware of, right. Yeah. All for saving any kind of waterfront kind of water land for the county, except if we can develop it somehow. Or I don't remember when a former administrator brought it up to us and said maybe for canoeing or something. I thought she said there was a little ramp or something that you could maybe slide a canoe it's, in, but that was about it. Yeah, oh, it's a ramp. little dirt ramp ditch sort of thing. But yeah. So if, uh, I'm just uh, concerned how that. I don't know which one's landlocked. It looks like they could get, I don't know whose property is landlocked. But I know see it's a wedge shape, but uh, I wouldn't mind just giving them some kind of easement in there if they need to get to their property, keep it same. Like we work with one of the other departments to, would you say we need another partner to go in with them? Or? Well, that wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily need another partner just to improve oh. the site, but it would help them get more grant money and to develop a further plan if there was a partner site so that there's an actual put in and take out spot and that would really be a benefit for okay. kayakers and canoers. I see. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? And just for historical purposes, Mr. Campbell who deeded this property in 1966 was a former treasurer of King Lee. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, so, so yeah, item item four A. I um, in the moment just read as our uh, you know kind of first agenda item, and uh, breezed right past it. So, uh, if we want to circle back to four A, and Ms. Journalin could go over those numbers with us. Included in the board packet this evening is a summary of the transfers from the treasurer's office from county operating bank account to schools operating bank account through April 30th, 2021. Total transfers to school is $9,499,248. The remaining funds appropriated for 2021 to be transferred is $2,522,568. Also included is a summary from the county revenues received for school funding through March 31st, 2021. The total funds received by the county to support school funding is 10,040,106. Um, In summary, the total amount transferred by treasurer has not exceeded the amount of revenues received by the county to support schools, nor has it exceeded the appropriation of the budgeted support to the schools. Um, I think I added a page to this this time. I know we do this every month, but I wanted to kind of just 
kind of show the board how it, it, it is, a, it's a balancing act here when we're trying to get the, the schools their funds because um, they need to have those funds, for, you know, for cash resources for the, for the schools. We have to wait for the revenues to come in, things like that. So, you know, in the past, the exercise that we just were presented, um, maybe that was the best way that they thought would uh, to approach how we would fund the schools. Um, the, uh, Dr. White, um, County Administrator, myself, and Stacy Longus met Friday. And uh, what I would like to do is actually um, work together with the treasurer and the schools, find out what kind of cash flows the schools actually need month to month. Um, typically, when we fund an agency, uh, we do quarterly payments or we do monthly payments or something like that. So rather than sending these odd amounts as they need, what we'd like to do is actually come up with a good amount that the county can afford to give to the schools monthly. Um, we're not sure if our bank account could uh, actually tolerate a two million, close to $2 million dollar transfer to the schools every month, because as you guys have already been made aware, there are times when our general, you know, our general fund drops substantially when the, the revenues are not coming in. So we're working with the treasurer and also with the schools to kind of get to a happy medium and then actually just, you know, get it down at the beginning of our fiscal year in 22, we all come to an agreement. This is how we're going to send the money over there. And rather than wiring funds from the treasurer's office, I'm proposing that we actually send that through our accounts payable, through the county's accounts payable where there's a tracking mechanism, just as if we were sending any other agency funding, you can track it through AP, you, you see the request, you see the documentation, there's no wires between bank accounts, it's as far as, you know, someone picking up the phone or someone doing something, you know, one person to the next, it's actually an ACH that's generated by our computer software directly into their bank account. So essentially what we, we would like to do is just get away from any wire transfers over to the school's bank account and everything, even if it's a resolution where the board has approved additional funding for whatever, it's ran through our accounts payable module. Uh, if, it, if it's a capital expenditure, what, we, what we're proposing is that uh, if it is coming from our split levy reserve fund, we have actually, what I've done is actually moved that out of into a specific fund, 150 is where we hold that money now. Any expenditures that the board approves to use that, those funds actually now come from that fund as an expenditure. So it's easier for us to track any kind of split levy revenue funds being utilized. Um, if it's something where the school is using the reserve and the board has approved them to use the reserve fund for their capital. In that situation, if they're using their school reserve funds, the funds are already sitting in their bank account. So then the schools would actually pay that capital expenditure. But like I said, this, the, the whole thing of when the revenues come in and getting the funds to the schools, that's what we're trying to balance out. Question. Now, Mr. Chair, Bill Hodges, but I, I don't have a question. I, I just feel a whole lot better about the way things are being handled right now uh, with her office and with the treasurer. Thank you. I guess it was just a question. When Ms. Bancroft was on there, I thought she said that they had combined all the accounts or she was in the process of combining all the accounts to premise and that the schools already has a separate schools account. She said she was going to deposit the funds straight into the schools and not do any transfers. I guess I'm confused at sure, what sure transfers enough. we're talking about. If she's going okay. to put the funds right into the school bank account directly. What are we going to, I can understand maybe like you said, maybe there's capital expenditures. Yeah, we completely can understand what you're asking. I mean, yeah, exactly. So currently we are continuing to do uh, deposit funds from the schools the same way the prior treasurer had set it up. And that the reason I believe that that was set up was because um, we were only taking one deposit to one bank. So CNF bank was the place to go. So the schools would send over revenue transmittals because the treasurer has to post all funds that are coming in, anything this, you know, as far as that the county finance and the school's finance can't actually post those revenue transmittals. 
So what happens is the schools, they send over a revenue transmittal. It could be cash, it could be checks, it could be from the cafeteria, it could be from funds that they've received for you know, a school trip and they need to get it into their bank account, whatever the situation. What happens currently is it goes into our CNF bank account. It never gets transferred back into our schools. As you can see in the, the document that I provided, when you see that section where it says TRO9, the treasurer set up a code. So basically, when you see that in July, we sent over $500,000 to the schools, you have to net out that $9,948 that actually resides in our bank account, but actually belongs to the schools. That's why everything got really, yeah. So she will continue right. to do, yeah. so what's going to happen when she has her Sona bank account as of July 1, definitely, we've already made the decision July 1, this is how it would happen, is those funds, when the schools bring them to the treasurer, now actually go into the correct bank account for either the cafeteria or the schools operating. Those are revenues that the school generated. They have nothing to do with local revenues, nothing to do with that at all. Anyone else? Okay, it all makes sense to me. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Board member requests. Is there anything that anybody would like to see in the future agenda or work session? We'll start with Mr. Hodges. Uh, I don't, and not anything on the work session or, or a meeting, but uh, I'd like uh, Stephen to get with Mr. Edwards concerning the matter with the, uh, ever what it was, an audit or whatever you want to call it. Stephen. When we first started with, the, with our new board here, Ed had brought up something about maybe some kind of spreadsheet or something that has, but eventually get all items that we've talked about, maybe even things in the past, because like we say things fall off. We don't know the process of them. We don't know the status of them. We don't know whether they've been resolved or Put on hold if we could get a list like that together to look at that way we have all the information together similar to the application process we were talking about that we have it something on hand all the time that we have a running tab on all the projects that are going on that we can don't have to keep like asking steve or asking uh, sherry about uh, the way things are going in certain departments that we we just we have the list right there just that something maybe a wish list <laughs> Or are you talking maybe about a list of current projects and their status? Exactly. Right. Maybe that. Um, I don't. Maybe that could exist in a, in a cloud, Mr. Wolf. Well, that could exist in a cloud. Well, I, I think this is probably, however, we it, it get it to us. Yeah. Um, as far as how the interim county administrator is 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 handling business right now, it would probably interface with his own management techniques. I don't know if he's a list manager or not. I am. Uh, not everybody is. <laughs> so, um, right. So uh, it, the easiest thing was be if he's got a running list that of projects and statuses that he could just share that with us. Yeah, I know we, uh, we had spoken uh, probably a couple of times when I was not long after we was Ed and I was sworn in, I brought up the topic of uh, prorating uh, personal property taxes, and Stephen brought it up uh, not long ago. And uh, I think it's still a conversation uh, that we need to have. That might be as money left on the table, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, also, uh, recently I've had a couple of complaints about Newcastle Road. One individual was uh, adamant that the improvements that were not made in commerce park drainage wise is a culprit uh we had someone from VDOT to go out and doing uh 
and analysis, and he said that he felt like that was not the direct result of it. But Commerce Park is a is a sore thumb for everyone, and I know that the previous boards have, have looked at it. And I guess, Travis, you can answer this question. I know that it's something about the bond money. It, it was a legal issue. And I would just like some clarity on that so maybe I could understand it. So the uh, the first answer to give you is the reason that we have never um, pulled the bond is because the General Assembly uh, had a moratorium on such an action. Uh, and I think they most recently carried that action through 2022, maybe 2021, but I think it's 2022. I'm getting enough nodding heads that I have it right, I think. Um, and so uh, regardless of whether or not there was a case uh, sufficient for us to pull the bond, we've been legally unable to because the General Assembly has not allowed uh, local governments to take such an action. Um, and if you can believe it, they'd still tie that back to the housing crisis of 08 when developers uh, hadn't uh, completed, uh, you know, proffered or guaranteed, uh, surety uh, is the word I'm looking for here, um, improvements and local governments were attempting to pull the bonds and the developers were crying foul because, you know, essentially saying they had run out of money because of the housing crisis. Of course, that happened in um, 08 and it's not 2008 anymore. It's not even the same decade, but we're still uh, operating with the General Assembly that's preventing us from doing that. Now, that's part two of the bond. I mean, the bond that they posted is still there. I mean, it's, it's never been released. So the bond is there. The problem is that the bond is probably insufficient for the improvements it's actually needed. Gentlemen, I cannot, I cannot hear. I cannot, I cannot hear. Sorry, Bill. Uh, V. Dot right. told me that that project would probably be eligible for a fifty percent cost share. Uh, I don't know how much bond is there. Uh, I'm wondering if that property. I don't even know who the, the owner is of that development anymore, but if it transferred hands, would that bond be transferred with the property also? Well, that would be a legal uh, question. I don't know. Yeah, I'd heard, I'd heard that rumor too, that it was a, a small amount. If, if the bond would be transferable, Probably the county could know, but maybe the EDA. I, I don't know. I'm just kicking it around. I don't know either, but it's always a topic worth revisiting until we find some type of resolution to it. So, uh, you know, maybe it's time for a refresher course in all things Commerce Park uh, development issues. And they did send me the punch list that was generated probably a year and a half ago. It was quite a bit. Oh, yeah. on, on it. You know, I could share it with y'all. Now, I know that we had a former planning director go out there and take a look at everything and, and, and generate a list and, and gather what they thought was a reasonable cost estimate, and it exceeded the bond amount. I don't remember the dollar amount of either one of those uh, precisely, but I do remember that it was far in excess of what was available by the bond, even if we were to be able to access it. So, um, But we need to continue to explore opportunities to, to resolve that. Um, you know, it's been on the back burner for more than a year now for, for several reasons. Um, so I'm happy to, to, to bring that back to a work session, um, get legal, you know, up to up to speed on where we are with the General Assembly legislation, recall what what is sitting in the bank account for the bond, the estimates that we received at the time. We've got a lot of information. It's just that none of our options were palatable or affordable, um, you know, when, when we were presented them. So, um, but I don't recall if VDOT had offered any type of cost sharing at the time, and I don't recall if even fifty percent took enough out of it to to, to reasonably effectively recover it. Right. So, so yeah, I'm I'm with you. Let's get that on a uh, on a work session agenda um, sometime soon. If we can talk about that. Well, should we also not uh, approach Delegate Wyatt since he is a new delegate for this uh, this area? I'm sure he's not aware at all of the whole project, but I think that's uh, to get it something moving in the legislature that he would be our man. Sure. So. Uh, 
I'm very familiar with the Commerce Park in uh, Essex County. It's LaGrange. They recently received a grant to improve and extend that. Uh, this is hearsay also, but uh, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we could look in to see if there's any, any grants available for that. I don't know. Right, so that's it. Um, I, I want to see as soon as we can get this balanced out, whoever we need to work with to get these numbers straight. But I would like to close the loop on a question that we had at the end of the budget. Uh, the, the very last meeting we had, which is I'd like to get a really clear understanding of where we stand with fund balance right now. Um, from, you know, I want to look at uh, it, its peaks and valleys as far as its balance, uh, you know, running from revenue collections. And I want to look at what our, you know, our balance is in excess of you know, basically where we're at as a minimum really are uh, because we've been working under an assumption for the last few years of what we really have realistically in there. And I don't know if that's a, a number that's still uh, accurate. And I think we probably all need to, to have an understanding of what that is from at the board level just so we know. Um, and then it's always kind of talked about as the static number. And I, and I understand just from going back from way back in the split levy where, where I learned everything I ever learned about accounting. Um, uh, you know, how it fluctuates, but I, I really want to see what our margins are so that, that everybody, the board and the public kind of understand what the purpose of that fund is and what it does and, and how it helps us balance books, and avoid RANs and all those other things that it does for us. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I know we've got to close. Anybody have that motion? Okay. In accordance with section 2.23711A5 of the Code of Virginia, I move that the Board of Supervisors convene and close meeting for the proposed expansion of an existing industry in King William County. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? A roll call, please. Ms. Carver? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Aye. Aye. We'll stand in closed session. We'll be back in a bit. All right, Travis, what are you going to do? With All right, motion to convene an open session. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve. That's all one. Oh, we need the motion to convene an open session first. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm jumping again. Open session. Right. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Lawrence? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Barber? Aye. Aye. Now SR1. All right, Mr. Chair, I, I move that we approve SR1. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Barber? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Aye. Aye. There's no other business. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Move seconded. Roll call. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? All right, all right. Now, gentlemen, I don't know about y'all.